Great to see everybody here. So I've been in the district 35 years. Um, I actually taught at Discovery the year it was open. I was music teacher for the first four years, moved into classroom for two years and librarian. So I have a long history with Discovery. I remember in the classroom next to the gym when you could see through the cinder block to the outside <laughs> and see the mold growing in it. Science experiment in the classroom. No. But anyway, it was kind of fun. So the reason I'm here today is to have a very brief discussion with you now that we've set up um, about technology and how you may have mobile technology at home and it doesn't have to be iPads, it can be any type of mobile technology and how you can use that technology to support your young learners. But really before we can get there we really have to have some common definitions and most of the common definitions that we're going to talk about could be full university level courses for two or three years and they're definitely full parenting <laughs> experiences for all 20 years so we are really glossing over them quite quickly because my time limit was short so first thing I'm sure that many of you have heard bandied about the term personalized learning this is a term that has been brought about by the ministry and it's actually not a bad word but what I'd like you to do is turn to the person next to you and I'd like you to just share with him your connection to that term at the moment. So have a moment, turn to your neighbor, and what does personalized learning mean to you? And by the way, in the classroom, your kids are asked to do things like this all along. So savor that feeling as you turn to your neighbor. Okay? Personalized learning. And in three, two, and in one. So I'm not going to ask you to share yet because we haven't built up the kind of trust that develops in a classroom for sharing of information. And we're going to talk about what's necessary when we're learning in a classroom. And you've experienced a little bit about what we have to do as teachers and what you need to do as parents when you're working with your crew at home or where you're working with a collection of munchkins that you have gathered together, there are certain things that you have to create in that relationship, in that environment. But what the government is really asking us to do is shift from, many of, from what many of you folks know. And remembering that I've been in school now for 51 years, I'm really shifting. And I love it. I truly, truly love it. Um, in fact, it's a little bit sad that it's here that I'm leaving my formal employment for the school district, that they're finally coming into this, this type of an, um, an approach. But when we take a look at our students and when we think about what you experienced in the classroom, the teacher would go to lots of books and we would look up what was expected to be taught that year. Somewhere between 1980 and the year 2000, those books went from being, oh, I don't know about that thick, to being about that thick. Because somebody decided in their wisdom that they really needed to put in a lot of detail about what every child at every grade level in every subject should know down to where the periods go and the commas go in those explanations. Really a lot of overload. A lot of overload in detail and it doesn't often reflect what comes into our classrooms. So 20 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, anybody? <laughs> so you have to be careful when I gauge ages here. So <laughs> Okay, I'm thinking about the time that you were 16, 17, 18. Just think back in your head about that time, how easy it would have been for you to afford, get the permission, or even get up the courage to get on an airplane and go to another continent. How many of you took advantage of that in your late teens or early 20s? Awesome. What decade? May I ask? Well done. My mother today still cautions me about going to Vancouver unsupervised. My boss, current boss, the first year I was in this role, um, I was to go to Calgary for smart technologies and he said, are you sure you're traveling by yourself? That's okay. And I thought, 
totally fine, <laughs> right? So the, the reason I ask that question is because we are exposed to a lot of things in our daily lives. And a lot of our children in some of the schools that we teach don't even know we're on an island have never experienced the difference between a town and a city. And when we ask, start to talk about community and the variations of community, don't really have any personal experiences to what that could be. So when I think back to 100 years ago in most of our schools, people pretty well had very similar experiences coming into the classroom, right? And so when we were trying to take children on in their learning to reach the level of being to, able to operate in society, um, we had pretty clear steps as to what was needed. Today, it's not so clear. And it's not so clear for two reasons. Number one, the amount of change that we're experiencing every day, exponential change in the last decade. And number two, the experience that, I'm going to use my finger, the experience that your child might bring into the classroom and your child might bring into the classroom and your child might bring into the classroom and your child might bring into the classroom are worlds apart, okay? And we're going to experience a little bit about, of that as we try and put some definitions together here. So personalized learning from the government of BC's perspective, and I'm quite on tune with this, or in tune with this, it means a shift from a set of very broad uniform learning outcomes and courses to learning in incre that is increasingly student-centric. So instead of having a zillion learning outcomes to which every child will have to prove mastery, what we have is a broader learning outcome to which your child might learn at it through a study of puddles, and your child might learn at it by building bridges, and your child might learn at it by becoming a wool farmer, right? And so it's that student interest, the student engagement that is going to become very important as we move forward in our educational career for the students and of course for the parents for mentoring them as they go along. So here's our new playing field and I hope you folks take the time to visit it. It is the site that the government has posted, the initial revised curriculum. The philosophy that's behind it is stated clearly and um, I think it's very approachable. It's something that you can get in and have a really good look at and say, oh, that's why they're trying to do things this way. So. We have the link there and you can have a look at it as we go along. Please excuse my drop G's. We did switch from an Apple to a, to, um, a Windows machine and I didn't go back and format the slides. So we need to talk about some common terms here and three terms that I'd like us to have a look at is learning, teaching, and education. Our district has defined our mission as educators to include to deliver learning opportunities that ensures the individual successes of all students. Now, underline the word individual and underline successes, right? We would like every child to be able to leave their grade 12 year feeling ready to move forward to enter society in either a new learning path as a professional student, and hopefully your sake, not a professional student forever, or into an occupation. If they want to go on for their master's, say, no, dear, you need world experience first, okay? Um, so what we also want to do is provide that within a safe, caring, and supportive environment. I'd like everybody to think back to a few minutes ago when you were sharing with your partner for the first time tonight, <laughs> right? It takes time to develop a safe, caring, supportive environment when a child knows that their needs, their questions, their risk-taking um, is going to be respected within the entire community of people within the classroom. So now, when we take a look at teaching as we're moving forward, you've probably heard the expression sage on the stage. It's a little what I'm doing right now, right? I'm trying to impart information to you. Normally, a workshop like this would be about two hours long, and I'd have you getting up, doing things, sharing, reflecting and on we would go. Staring at these devices like this and not really getting into them is not the way that's optimal, but teaching is no longer that. I'm not going to stand here and I'm going to preach to you all night and at the end of it, you're going to get a test on it and you either know it or you don't know it. Right now, my nephew in, in Scotland taking his master's and you know what he has to deal with? He teaches 
The students are only marked on what they copy into their exercise books, and at the end of the year they get an exam, either pass or fail. Students are not very engaged in the classrooms. You can copy it down from somebody else, but here's the kicker around that. You have to pass in your notebook at the end of the day so that you've copied it during the class. Very hard to learn to be a teacher in those circumstances. So we have moved from that type of an environment to one where we are definitely facilitating. We're definitely out there with our little old uh, radars doing a little bit of presentation here and there. But what we're doing a lot is questioning and help the, helping the kids identify where they want to go next and helping them connect to the type of information that they need to get to move them on to that next step. Information and experiences are really, really critical. So what have we got as learning for our definition? Well, to be involved with learning, yes, personalized, to be involved with learning, there's a heck of a lot of risk taking. How many of you have turned to a member of your family and said, really honestly, I really don't know how to do this. I really don't understand what's meant by this. I don't get it. You guys are all you know, speaking Greek. I just don't get it. Like, is that something you would do first of all, or you would try to sort of worm around and get your answer without perhaps exposing the fact that you're not quite so comfortable at stating that um, you don't know what you're doing? And guess what, folks? If you already know it, why are you at school learning? Because if you know it, we're in the process of, or in the, perp in the job of teaching you that next step. But if you know it all, how can we teach you that next step? So teachers help students identify where they are in their learning and where they need to go next. And the kids need to take, be able to feel comfortable with risk taking, that the teacher is there to scaffold them and the students are there to be part of their learning journey. Um, trying multiple ways of uh, gaining understanding. Does anybody have in their family somebody who's like me and quite talkative? Okay, does anybody in their family have somebody that's not talkative at all and instead just likes to sit there, take it all in, but their hands are busy putting things together? Okay, so participating, learning more about learning styles and trying to figure out your learning style and what you get in terms of learning style and looking at the friends and how they all put together is very fascinating. The teacher in the classroom not only has to break out of their comfort zone of their learning styles, and know that they need to meet the learning styles of their students. Just a quick question, did anybody come out of their mother's womb already printing? Okay, so I'm guessing that it's not a surprise to you that for most of us, having a print-based learning style is not the most common of learning styles. Okay? Our society may be print-based, but it's certainly not the most common. And the other big thing in here is just being vulnerable. It goes along with the risk taking. So, where is that going to take us? I have a piece of paper on your desk. Some of you can share and others may get one to themselves. So in the top corner, what I would like you to put in the top left corner is educated citizen. At the grade tw end of grade 12, what skills would you say your child has to have to be an educated citizen at the end of grade 12? Okay, jot down what's most important to you. And so we have lots of pens and pencils over here. We can pass them around. Anybody else need one? Okay, and you don't have to be doing, quiet, be doing this quietly. You can ask a neighbor, you can yell across the room. So, you know, Sarah, what do you think? Okay, what makes an educated citizen? by the end of grade 12. Don't turn them over. Don't turn them over. Which is usually a challenge to see who turns them over first. Don't turn them over. <laughs> About one more minute. Don't worry, this is not like Scotland. I'm going to judge you on your written response.
pretty bad, eh? And Dylan, doesn't Dylan come from Glasgow? We chose the University of Glasgow for the reason of uh, assessment for learning instruction. Okay, turn your paper over that I handed to you and look at the top section. Underneath the uh, District 79, and these goes, go back, I think probably six, seven, eight years now, these were the school district uh, elders attempts to define what characteristics an educated cit citizen would have. Okay, now if you want to jot a few things down on your paper because you think some of those ideas are great or if you want to do a little updating, that's awesome. Adam, can I ask you to just play that video for me now? Thanks. I'm going to introduce you to a young 13-year-old. This is a three-minute clip. You might not let it play all the way. Adam had the opportunity to talk um, at a, um, sorry, not Adam. Got the name mixed up now. But this young 13-year-old talked at uh, in Nevada at one of the TEDx conferences. He was homeschooled. Uh, the reason he was homeschooled, he'll tell you a little bit about. What I'd like you to do is not just listen to his words. I want you to watch his body language. I want you to listen to his tone. And yes, there's a lot of wisdom in his words as well. Think about that educated citizen. It's called um, hack school. Yeah, keep going up there. All right. Can you do a fourth? Quick time we had before. Yeah. Oh no! I may introduce you to this fellow a little later. Steve Jobs. There you go. <laughs> So this is what I'm going to do because I think it'll be great for you to meet him. So I'll play it to you at the end. But any comments about what being an educated citizen means to you? Let's have a little popcorn, throwing some ideas into the center. So should the person be able to read and write? Is that an essential criteria or a wished for criteria? Why? communicate in the written format okay okay so hands up quick vote everybody should be able to read how how would you define reading what if I'm blind have you just eliminated me from being an educated citizen I have access to Braille or I have access to audio okay what about writing Maybe I can't write in the normal way, but there may be, sorry, in the, uh, mm, hard to say normal. Mm -mm. I can't, yeah, in the traditional way, um, but I could be able to record my thoughts in other ways. Okay? All right, what else is needed for an educated citizen? Okay. Unless we know our target, there's no sense bringing out any tools. Absolutely no reason to bring out any tools. So we've got reading, writing, what else do we need? Okay, we need to have social skills, both the expressive being in a crowd, being able to communicate. We also have to have those empathetic types of skills where we're able to judge by how far a person's pulling back, how they're sitting in their seat, whether it's time to draw them in and how we can draw them in or let them take that time out. So the social skills are really important. What else? If you don't know who you are, how are you going to be able to move forward? Okay. How many of you think that your children still think they're mini yous? Mini mini me's? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> they certainly develop their own personality at a very, very early age, don't they? Own strengths are starting to show through. It's absolutely awesome. What else? Tell me about numeracy. What do they need to be able to do? Pardon? Can you give me a little bit more information on math skills? Mm 
Mm -hmm. Problem solving, banking. And do you know what banking is? The concrete of being able to deal with bartering systems through to a cash hard environment to change for a real good to now being totally abstract. Even the shopping process is abstract. Very hard for our youngsters to connect to something they really haven't been physically involved in before. Okay, should uh, children be able to estimate? How do you build up estimation skills? Experience? How? Yep, trial and error. You've got to be willing to try and you've got to be able to joke about it and get you know, up many, many times and do it again. I had a lot of Asian homestay students. They were absolutely great at calculations. They could not estimate to save them from their souls. You took them shopping and you said, oh, oh, how much do we have in our buggy? You know, the credit card will take care of that. No, no idea how to estimate. <laughs> yeah, the magic card. Yeah, but even going to them and saying something like, how far to go from there to here? Couldn't give me a measurement. Ask them to break down the most intricate shapes. Expert on it because their language is based on that spatial relationship. So, anything else for educated citizen that we need to be able to do? Learn. Because most of these kids as they go forward are going to have multiple jobs. They're going to have multiple disappointments as they go forward to trying to go through those multiple jobs. So we as parents want to be able to support our children, but we want to support our children being not successful through their efforts to learn as they <laughs> realize that learning is about, not all about getting it right the first time, right? That perseverance is an incredibly important skill and resiliency is an incredibly important quality that we must foster. Okay, so educated citizen, you're feeling pretty good now about your definitions. Take a look, maybe jot down a word or two more, and we're gonna move forward. So, long time ago, in fact, this was starting to wear out a little when I went to university, which is in the late 70s, we had Bloom's taxonomy. And Bloom said that the lower order of thinking skills was just retaining knowledge, and that the higher level, of course, was getting into evaluation. Most of our school for, schools for many of our children was 90, 95% knowledge, okay? And in some of the countries, evidently Scotland at the moment, it is still knowledge-based, all right? When we're taking a look at Bloom's taxonomy today, we have learned a lot about being educated citizens because we've learned a lot about um, we've learned a lot about learning from the scientific and not just the art of teaching. So this came out probably also late 70s, I would think, where we started to break down and realize that that information that we're picking up by print or just taking in, we're only really recalling 20. 10% of it, what we listen, 20%. How many people have seen this, this graphic before? Okay, parents, you need to take a good look at this graphic. Because with disciplining, if you're saying, now, darling, I've said that you need to really make your bed. Well, you know what? If you have one of those children that fit in, the 20% will remember it through oral instructions. You're doing well. <laughs> but it's in the minor of the skills. 30% of what we watch, we retain. Sorry, mom, you're making the bed. 50% of what we watch and listen together, so that guidance, that mentoring, many of our old societies where the adult is working, the child is working along with them. 70% um, of what we say and 90% of what we do. Okay, I'm gonna take a pause right here because A, I'm running out of time, we've had these iPads sitting in front of you for an awful long time. So here's mine. I'm going to take its cover off. Don't ever buy this cover. It's too expensive and it's a pain. So this is an iPad. How many of you have an iPad at home? Wiggle a finger. You don't ever have to feel like you have to do this. Sometimes I have the kids do this, you know this. You smile because you know what? It feels quite different to be like that when you're the one who's not putting up your hand, right? So. If you have one of these at home, you almost have to forget everything you know when you were using these at school. Because we are not using these as, here dear, we're driving to Victoria. Keep yourself busy. Right? And we're not doing it as, Aah! all right, there's the game. You can play it now. Right? These are coming in as a device that's being used by multiple people. 
we're suggesting that they're being used at t uh, for a time period of no less than about an hour and 15 minutes, more than that at a time. And the criteria for which we're including this technology in the schools, it is for critical creative thinking that captures and supports the process of learning. How many of you probably have just a little bit of a sticky attachment that technology is only used either A, for entertainment, or B, for creating and an end presentation? No, that's not why we're bringing them into the schools. We're bringing them into the schools because little Johnny over here is not a print-based learner. In fact, probably more than 80% of our kids are not print-based learners, yet didn't come out printing. We need to talk, we need to share, we need to build language, we need to build concepts, we need to move our bodies, we need to build models, we need to capture pictures and videos and go back and evaluate them before we ever get the chance or should have to have the chance of putting what we know down in that foreign abstract form called printing and writing. Okay, for society, we've had to master that, but there have been many successful societies that go along with oral traditions, okay? So why do I like mobile devices? I like mobile devices because they can capture time. That's the first thing that appealed to me. If you've ever worked with your child and you've told your child not to do something and they've gone around and done what you told them not to do, now I'm not suggesting you put one of these in there as a, um, shall we say, capture the crime type of device. But if I have a group of students that are working together and Johnny beforehand was asked to be what we call the, um, what do we call him? The reporter? No, the recorder. Thank you. So Johnny's job was to watch four people in the circle and at the end discuss with the group the things that went well and the things that didn't go well. Isn't it much more powerful to be able to hold this to the side, record the conversation, and then as a group go back and take a look at what went well, what didn't go so well, and set your goals for the next time. So one of the reasons I like this is because it captures time. Another thing, does anybody here talk to themselves? Okay, rehearse little things like, you know, when so-and-so gets home, I want to make sure I tell them this, this, and this. Oh, wait a minute, that order's not so good. Maybe I better do it this way. And, you know, maybe I shouldn't, oh, I shouldn't mention that, right? These are great because in different types of apps, the types of apps that we've selected, we've selected the apps that allows the students to capture their thinking in kind of an audio note form and then listen back to their thoughts outside their head and go, that's a good one, that's a keeper. No, that makes no sense at all. I better explain that a little bit more before I capture it in print. So now with these devices, we've got the ability to capture time. We've got our ability to capture thinking outside of our head. We've got the ability to accommodate the diverse learners that we have in our classroom. Because you know what? Maybe your thinking is rocket science level, but your writing is medical doctor standard. Okay? And unless we have a sh way of sharing that, we're hooped, right? And the, the frustrating thing is for a lot of kids who don't have that confidence to be themselves and explore and understand that they have certain strengths, but also certain weaknesses that need to be accommodated, they end up practicing the weaknesses and never get to that content of learning that's so exciting, right? I hate social studies, and I hate social studies today. I, I can't even tell you, when I first started teaching, it took me three months to find Labrador. Seriously, I hated it that much, and I was pretty sure they had changed his name or they'd moved it somewhere, but I got it under control eventually. Um, the reason I bring that up is kids turn off, right? Especially grade four, grade five, grade six boys, right? If you have not built up their self-esteem as a learner by then, you are going to have a really hard time treading backwards to get them engaged again, okay? So back on topic here for a moment, we have Bloom's Taxonomy. And in your second block now, I'd like you to put down active learning. Kids learn by being active. Does anybody have really someone in their house that really likes to sit still and just take everything in sitting in quietly? <sighs> right. Wouldn't that be nice? It would be nice for her for a little while and then it get really spooky. <laughs> Okay, so what I'd like you to do is think about 
all of the things that we have to learn today. Active learning. What would you like to be doing in the classroom to learn something new? It might help if you envision something in your head about what you would like to do. So for maybe a moment, you want to be that mad scientist. Maybe for a moment, sorry, you are going to be the home ec whiz. You are the next, you are the next one who will be the great chef of Canada while you're going to be the big bridge builder. Okay? And maybe you're going out to challenge Garth Brook. Okay? Super special he put on in December if you didn't get a chance to see that. So take a moment. What would you have there for active learning? What's going to make your life in the classroom something that makes you want to come back? Okay, start jotting a few notes down. One of the saddest things I discovered when I was up at Coheman teaching in about 1998 is I tried to ask my students, <laughs> encourage my students to participating, participate in a writing activity that involves some sort of landscape around water. So I said, being very naive, um, what do you think a brook sounds like? A brook? Okay, you know, it's a small stream. Okay. What words could we use to describe the sounds that a small stream would make? I've never seen one. They may have been by one, but did they really look and pay attention to it? Nope. So, one of the first things that parents can do to support child's learning, children's learning using these mobile devices, get that movie out. You're not going to save it. You're not going to archive it for years. But if you're somewhere and you see a good-looking cow doing something, take a picture, a video of that good-looking cow, and help your child develop language around it by questioning them. What's this cow doing? What do you think you'd rather be doing? What words could you use to describe him? Involve in the play of questioning around what you see. Involve in the practice of reflecting on something that you did earlier in the day with an actual artifact of what you have experience that day and record some of their writing. Great to take a picture, put it on a piece of paper in pages, put the photo in the middle and have the kids write really neat words around it to describe what they were thinking. Change the color of those words, change the font of those words before you know it, you're teaching formatting. Excellent, your teachers will appreciate that. But you're also connecting them to the fact that the word write, when you're talking about, oh, I don't know, Paintball fights, <laughs> the word right is probably not going to be written in little black font and not very fancy letters. Bright is probably going to be written in fluorescent letters and it's going to be written large and it's going to have a fun font to it. So those kids take away a feeling and a connection to what the word bright means. It's not just a word on a spelling list <laughs> that they're going to try and recite and probably mix up the GH. Okay? So one little example right there where you can pull them in. Yeah? Yes, it made it come alive. And so here's something else that they can do after with those mobile devices. They have captured what's gone along, and now they're going to report out later on and put out an early newscast of what it would have been like to be in, um, a gold rush miner in those days. So if you've got the old fella sort of sitting there taking on that role playing, don't let him chew the tobacco okay, while he's getting into this role playing. But, you know, a hat made out of paper or something like that, and he's sitting there being interviewed. This child is now in role as that character. Do you watch TV uh, shows with your children? I'm sure that you do. <laughs> and movies. Well, why not afterwards have them act out some of those? And you question them. And do a little filming of it. You know, today we saw this. This is what happened. If you were Harry Potter, just why did you do that? Right? 
You're helping to build their critical thinking. You're also helping to build their creative thinking. And most importantly, you're giving fun to words and language before the children ever have to sit down with a piece of paper that looks very daunting and a pencil and go, oh yeah, I'm writing a paragraph on Harry Potter and why he did that dumb thing. Okay? So something really important to remember is that having that mobile device with you and just the built-in functionality of the camera gives you lots of opportunity for playing with language, playing with questioning. The whole sense of discovery is what makes teachers enjoy being teachers. It's not the discipline part, trust me, nor the social working part. It's the part that I can tease you into realizing that, yeah, you are the most incredible artist when you sit down and you tackle the feline family of animals. You've just got that knack, right? And I can help question, and I can help provide the materials that will get you there. And then you're going to start investigating where to go next. Parents, the more talking we can do, capturing we can do based on your common experiences, and valuing the time to reflect together and share one-to-one -one and share with family members is irreplaceable. So teaching these days is not just an art. When I was at Coheman in 1995-96, we had a grandfather who visited the school and was aghast that one of the teachers' names was Mrs. because married ladies aren't allowed to teach. So you know what decade he came from. But for many, many years, what we learned about teaching was not based on brain science. And today we are very, very fortunate that brain science is moving us to know which of the criteria, which of the uh, techniques we're using, skill strategies that we're trying with our students are based on very solid brain research. But if I am a dead frog in my interpersonal skills and I can't develop trust with my students, I'm not going to go far, okay? Even if I know the science, unless I have the art, I'm not going to get too far. So what we found is that with the brain's research, that there is a portion of the brain that we call the recognition network. And this is where we gather facts and categorize them, but it's not just from print. It's every orifice of your God-given body or science, whichever philosophy you go with, that allows you to take in information. How many of you learn from the news? Okay, you may not agree with it, but, right? So you're picking video, you're listening to it from the kitchen while you're cook, cooking. This is available if you want to have it, so don't worry about it. Um, go to cast.org. The research is there, the graphics are there, the strategies are there. It's an excellent, excellent site. So the Recognition Network talks about how we take meaning from our world around us as this entity. So as a human, for me, I'm going to eat something if it's green and the feeling is right, the texture is right. If I taste something that's green and the texture is not right, it's not happening, right? Learn that from an early age. For other kids, it might have been, if it's green, I'm going to eat it. If it's red, I'm not. The visual cues were very, very strong. For others, it's a tactile. They're learning so much from the tactile, from the movement, from the shape. And it's not just the old joke of who reads the instructions and who doesn't. Okay? One of my ways of bringing technology into the school is if we have to read instructions to be able to use it, we can't do it. Teachers are too busy. It has to be intuitive. It has to be something we can give to the children and say, here, tell me how to do it. Okay, because they'll figure it out really, really quickly. So think for a moment, what type of learner are you? At home, are you picking up most of your information from somebody talking to you? Are you picking it up mostly because you're reading? Are you picking it up mostly because you're doing? And that just touches the surfaces of different intelligences. So in the classroom for many, many years, the, type, the way that information was presented to kids was basically by the, the teacher standing and talking, the film strips were really not worth it. The old files, <laughs> films were really not too worth it. <laughs> you didn't have to roll them back up or get the inches of dust off them. Or you read from books that were old, often written on, dog-eared. You, you pulled the information in this way. Okay? 
learning. And if your classroom was not allowed to talk too much, you certainly weren't learning from the experiences of the other people in the class. All right? Today, we know we learn from the listening, the watching, the doing, the conversation that has to occur to build conceptual understanding. That has to happen. And so when we take a look at the recognition network, very, very important. We take a look at the strategic network, and this is where we plan. This is where we make connections on all the information that we have gathered into our minds. All right? So strategically, we know how to put it together. We get ready to represent our understanding in some way. And finally, we come to the um, effective networks. Now, up until about 19, I'd say 85, the parent used to be the student's effective network. You go to school. You sit, you listen, and if you don't do it when you come home, you'll get the consequence, right? That stopped working completely, and for really good reasons. Those young children are individual learners that we need to engage in the classroom. I'm not saying bend over backwards, but we need to find out where they are in the learning and where they need to go next. So we need to know what type of learners they are. We need to have on hand the type of resources that are going to be able to meet those learners' needs. So, breaking these down further, we come in the school district to recognizing that knowing this brain information, we know we have to have multiple means of representing information so that if student A gets it this way and student B gets it this way, both have a chance of getting that information and then sharing and having that discussion. We know that we have to have multiple means of action and expression. And that really, really does mean that if little Miss Jan Bradley <laughs> is the world's class ballet dancer, even if she's as clumsy as an ox. If that's the way she best expresses her understanding, she needs to have that opportunity. Well, we might have another person in grade three who's writing a three-page thesis on why that is so. And then finally, we have the multiple means of engagement. And we have those people that are highly, highly visual, highly, highly tactile. And if we're able to offer, offer those type of activities within our classroom, then we're able to engage those students in our types of activities. So where has, where has the district tech department gone? We've taken a look at many, many different graphics to try, and, um, to try and sort of summarize what we know through the various um, strategies, sorry, the various initiatives that our district has been involved with smart learning, um, assessment for learning. And we know that from this, students in the 21st century need to have access to the tools and resources anytime and anywhere. That means I'm not going to book going to the computer lab next week at 10 o'clock to be able to go online to find things about ORCAs when my children are learning about it now and there are no books in the library on it. And by the way, if there were books on the library on it, they were probably purchased 15 years ago. And what we'd really like to hear about is what's happening in Sochi right now with the whales that are being captured for display, which is against conventions, right? That's where we want to get out. That's where we want to engage our students and get them on and learning. We need to have evidence-based practice. So we're not bringing technology into the classroom just because it's a cool tool, right? How is it going to enhance the learning experience for the students? It has to be authentic and relevant to curriculum, okay? Don't go there, Heather. Okay. <laughs> assessment for learning. We know that in the stages of assessment for learning, and we've been working with teachers in the district on gaining an understanding of it, so I'm just going to say assessment for learning for you folks right now, but it's basically moving the children through to taking ownership of their learning because they are so involved in all of the uh, work from the initial um, from the initial engagement in the topic of what they've chosen to study for the lear their learning outcome, all the way through the process of learning, its highs, its lows, to finally having that understanding at the end and seeking where they're going to go next. So it has to be tied in for assessment for learning, which means it has to be timely and relevant as well. Cultural of creativity and innovation for humans. There are very few of us that like to do the same old, same old, same old, same old, right? Learning is connecting to what we already know, taking a new understanding forward. So we need to have technology that will help us move forward and finally social and emotional learning. So now what I need you to do is think about what we've got in school right now. 
think about instructional technology. Think about the type of technology that could be in this school right now. Forget about dollar signs. Okay, just think. In order to have your students, your children, have access to the type of information and the type of activities that will engage them, what type of teaching and learning tools would best assist those who are here. And I haven't had the cane pull me off yet. Am I still okay for a few more minutes? Okay. <laughs> bad, it's bad. I had coffee earlier, sorry. Okay. We have a couple of teachers at the school who have been thoroughly trained in the use of interactive smart boards and they've almost died having to change their practice back to something that they knew 15 years ago because they've seen the benefits. That's just one example. Having a set of school, um, having a set of school cameras is something that 10 years ago would have been lovely. Now, a set of iPads is your camera, your movie camera, as once we get people over the fear of taking them outside. A baggie works really well to put iPads in when you take them outside. They still take wonderful pictures. And they're relative, yep. Not too thick. Clean baggie's good. <laughs> yep. So a baggie is an excellent thing. Take them fishing. Uh, sorry, not the iPads fishing. But when you take the kids out to Goldstream, when you take them out to do those events on a slightly moist day, have them in the Ziploc bags and have a great time. Okay, so why iPads? Now, you folks probably realize that we're an Apple-based district. That's shifting. It's shifting primarily because our servers had to talk to our computers. We went Apple because Apple came and price for price when we were looking at the type of software based on creative, critical thinking. Not the word processing, not the rehearsal, not the let's type out our essay for the 30th time. I really wish our teacher had never talked about goldfish type of activity and why do I practice my spelling words this way. So why iPads? Number one, the mobility. You can learn in the classroom with them, you can learn outside with them, and your internet here stretches a fair amount, but you can also go to various places, you can hook into the internet, and it's so wonderful to be down on the beach with the kids and they're taking pictures, or they're bringing a sample up to you, and they say, what's this, Heather, what's this? And I'm going, I don't have a clue, but let me look it up, right? And the learning continues in the moment. It's not delayed until you get back. So the interest and the spark of learning that you have going is there. There's also connection to resources. There is a lot of free resources out there. Some of them are good. Some of them are absolutely horrible. But a life skill is learning how to sift through. So print. iPads have great print. Not only do they have print that's size 10, they have print that's size 12, they have print that's size 14, and you can stretch it as big as you want. So talk about diversity in your classroom and needs and comfort levels. We have children that do learn much better when you have white print on a black background. Scientific. It's not whimsical. It's scientific. So for those particular children, isn't it great we can have that option? I do not want to try that with a print book. Okay? Having said that, I am not a proponent for libraries going electronic. We have to have print materials because the whole experience, and I, you know, don't take this like the Japanese tea ceremony, but if I want to read for enjoyment, I curl up with a book. I can't do that with an iPad, but for my work and the amount that I have to keep up with, I can't, A, afford to buy all those books in print. They're half price usually in um, digital format, but the way I can bookmark, skim, have it read to me, etc., gives me a versatility that's really important. And kids don't assume just because they know how to read print off of a piece of paper, know how to read print off of a device. Finally, images. You can have still images or you can have photographs, sorry, photographs or drawing. The whole ability to draw on the screen with your finger takes us back to the times where we used to teach children how to print by having them write on surfaces with their finger, trace over on sandpaper, follow images that the teacher has put out for them. So there's a lot to be said for that. When it comes to the video and the moving images, we have animation, we have stop motion, and yes, you can become another Spielberg. 
So what are the apps that the, te that the district has proposed as being very important or our standard set? Based on critical creative, we have not put on rehearsal apps except for our K-1 years. Because for K-1, they're not going to be able to practice the sound of ah from a piece of paper. They need to have activities where they have that audio playing back to them. And then they need to have those activities where it will say ah, they'll say ah, and it'll record it, and then they can hear it both together. How close was I? <laughs> right? And the iPads can be terrific for that. So we have another list that we have for the primaries, but this is what we have come up with. Own cloud is included because of FOIPA regulations, freedom of privacy and information. We cannot store your child's information outside of Canada without A, having your permission, and B, um, the district feels very strongly that we adhere to FOIPA to the letter because if something is occurring, we want to be able to intervene with it immediately. We want to be able to fix it, remedy close it down if we need to. So we have what's called own cloud, which is open source, which basically means your children can store their files on a server at this school that's accessible from in the school and out of the school. I had a child at Shemaine Secondary say to me, oh, we never use the computers here. I say, said, why not? And they said, because we can't access our work at home. So now they can access their work at home because the own cloud servers allow you to go from inside and out. Own Cloud also works with the iPads, and there's a whole bunch of things around that. PhotoSync is great because Karina is my partner. She's taken a whole bunch of real nifty pictures. I've gone out and taken some nifty pictures. Now we're partners, and between the two of us, we have to choose the three or four best ones that represent the learning outcome that we're working towards. So we'll both look at them, we'll delete what we don't want, and we'll share back and forth until we have the same. I also call it the teacher's mothership. So if Jan's a teacher at the class, at the end of the class, K-1-2, the children have made a movie, they've done an animation. They have sat there and practiced their reading, and now Jan wants to see how they've progressed in their fluency or accuracy, depending on what tasks they've been working on. Well, that sound file goes back to Jan as a movie clip. So you can do the same thing. If your child is doing some silent reading or some reading to themselves or reading to their buddy, just put the iPad over there and over to one side. Let it be part of that and record that reading to buddy. And it's a little story of, you know, tonight I'm reading to Sam this story. And then they can play being you and ask some questions in the end, too, and it gets even better. So own cloud photo sync are the type of activities that we add to, or the apps that we add to for processing and handling of information. Keynote pages and mental. Mental is really not crazy. Have any of you you've heard of mind maps? Mind maps are when you take a big idea and then you do bubbles off of it. Concept maps are when I might take the big idea of animals and I might put over here um, jungle. And so the relationship between animals and jungle, help me out here ladies, it's the end of the day, might be you know a subspecies. Or I might put over here fishes, so it's one type of living thing. So the difference between a uh, mind map, and by the way, this one's free. The difference between a um, mind map and a concept map is children are challenged and adults are challenged to, between the two bubbles on that line, state the relationship. It's really, really good. You can summarize a whole biology uh, chapter for study into one effective concept map. Much, much more useful to talk through and study prior to an exam. So when we take a look at story writing with the kids, relating um, activities, what's happened during the day, wouldn't it be great if you could have the kids list all of the things that they've done during the day and attach to it the feelings that they may have had, or what would I like to do next, okay? So very much open-ended. Keynote in the end can be presentation, but it can also act like an electronic, um, it can also act like an electronic um, notebook and collect uh, uh, you're out researching on the cats, you can copy the URL from the website down, you can take a snapshot of some of the text information, put it on the page, later on you're going to come back and you're going to pull out the key points, and you're going to summarize it into your own words, connect your own understanding to it. So Keynote is not just a PowerPoint type of presentation. The three on the far side deal with um, creating animations. I want to bake a cake. How do I bake a cake? Well, I take a picture, maybe 240 pictures of me baking a cake, and by the time I'm finished, I have a stop-motion movie of me having baked a cake. 
could be as simple as, how do you write your name? Take some beads out, take some macaroni out of your cupboard, have them write their name, and every time they put one down, take a picture. Put another one down, take a picture, put another one down, take a picture, put another one down. Before you know it, they've spelt their name. All those pictures go together and you have a movie of their name being spelt. And what's great is they can do a sound recording on top of it. But don't just stop at names. What about one plus two? One plus four? They can have that written down, but they can talk, take a picture as they draw one object above. Talk, draw a picture as they take a picture, as they put each of the objects to represent four. And before you know it, you have a movie where they've spoken through their understanding of what one plus four is. That is worth maybe reciting one plus four is five, one plus four is five, one plus four is five, at least 50 times by making that one movie. Because now they've got picture to it, they've got kinesthetic to it, they've got auditory to it, and you know what? They've been engaged. It's kind of fun.